Uh, so, uh, good morning. I would like to thank you all for coming. Uh, we are receiving people uh, from Scotland and from the Netherlands. We have a project. We are developing a project. It's a partnership. It's a partnership between FGV, Serving University, and Utrecht University. And uh, we have uh, an, uh, in uh, each year. The, we have a, a workshop, a conference, and last year it was uh, held in Utrecht University, this year in FGV, and the next year it will be held in Stirling University in Scotland. And uh, we invite the professors uh, to, to be with us, uh, to talk to you, and to, to share some to share some yeah. experience. Yes, experience in uh, research interests, uh, uh, what, they want. what they want to talk. Yes, I think it will be very interesting. Thank you. And um, I'd like to introduce uh, all the team. Or I, I have all the, the CVs here, but I think it's better ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, Albert and William will be talking, but we have uh, other people with us. So, would you like to start, Charlie? Okay. I'm Charles Lelu from University of Stirling in Scotland. I, I work in a research centre called CRISP, the Centre for Research and Information Surveillance and Privacy. And I work with William, who you're going to hear from in a few minutes. I work as a researcher on the, on the Smart Governance of Sustainable Cities project. Okay. okay, my name is Stan Gibman. I'm a professor in planning support science from Utrecht University in the Netherlands. Um, my background is in uh, urban planning and in uh, geographical information systems, and I try to combine these two different fields into one. And I'm also very much interested in smart cities and smart governance in particular. Okay. Uh, my name is Anke Michels. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Utrecht University. Uh, I'm also part of the project supervising one of the PhDs. Um, and my main research subject is um, uh, citizen participation in relation to issues of democracy. Yes, um, my name is Susanna Tomor, and uh, I'm working at the University of Utrecht with Albert, Stan, and Ank. Uh, I am doing this research as a PhD, and I am uh, investigating uh, cases, different cases in Utrecht, to see how people, citizens, work together with municipality, local governments, with the use of technology to. Well, my name is Marie. I'm also a part of this uh, team, uh, the collaboration uh, FGB, and now I'm visiting professor at FGB, and I'm research um, also in participation, digital um, data, so smart cities. Oh, I am a PhD student here at FGV, and I'm as I am part of the smart government project also. Yes, and the team is Albert, uh, William, and me as well. So thank you for for the presentation. And if you would like to present yourself, okay, yes, great. Okay. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak, and thank you all for coming to listen to me speak. Um, I'm going to talk about 20 minutes, hopefully. I've got five, six slides. Um, and what I'm going to talk about essentially is I'm going to talk about this research centre, Chris. Um, we'll talk about how we conceive the research centre, what we do, um, some of the projects we're involved in, and some of our kind of parental underpinnings, because it's quite a unique research centre. So I think it might be interesting for you to hear about how we've gone about our business. To start, as I've been asked, um, I'm Professor William Webster. Um, I am a professor of public policy and management at the University of Stirling in Scotland. I'm also one of the directors of this research centre that I'm going to refer to called Chris, the Centre for Research into Information, Surveillance and Privacy. Those are our uh, important contact details down there, Twitter, the, the website and my email address. 
Um, now, the reason why I put up here my formal title is because I think that might help in terms of understanding how we've approached our subject matter in, in this research centre. So, my background is as a scholar of public administration, particularly a scholar who has an interest in e-government. So, over time, um, my area of interest has evolved. So, starting off with traditional public services interest, evolving into e the e-government area as a young scholar, but now with a much more explicit interest, but not solely, but with a more of an explicit interest on um, surveillance and surveillance consequences um, in society. So I will talk a little bit more about surveillance in a moment. Now, um, this is just a, a snapshot. Well, it's not particularly clear, but this is a snapshot from, from our website. Um, and you will see that in terms of uh, our branding, we have typical, we have a, a we have a number of kind of cues that we always use. So we have our very bright red crisp logo, we have our digital footprint, and we have these kind of track lines, research expertise policy. So what we're alluding to here is that this is a, an academic activity or an academic arrangement which is trying to influence society or influence public policy. We're not just writing journal articles. We actually have more of an outreach and engagement practice, which I'll talk more about. So you find on the website, you'll find lots of interesting things, including events that we're uh, we're engaged in. A lot more information. We are a very networked research centre. We're a collaborative arrangement between four different universities. Okay, so it's my university, the University of Stirling. It's the University of Edinburgh, which is also in Scotland. The University of St Andrews, which is also in Scotland. And we have a new fourth partner, just hot off the press, which is the University of Essex. So we're a networked research centre, and that allows us to tap into different expertise at different universities. So across the four universities, we have about 40 researchers involved in um, different projects, um, not always collaborating at the same time, but working in different projects from many different academic disciplines, from my own discipline through to management scholars, through to uh, legal scholars, we have computer scientists, we have philosophers. Um, so we have lots of different academic disciplines represented within the research centre. Um, we also have, um, research centre I should say is five years old, so it's relatively new, it's a relatively new, new endeavour. Um, we have, so five years old, four centres of activity, about 40 researchers, um, always a number of projects on the go. So maybe four or five different research projects, funded research projects. We also have PhD students, maybe four or five that are specifically located in this research centre. So that's our kind of that's our kind of branding. Um, these are these are the, the four directors, um, and what we have here is a research centre. What's unique about the research centre is that although it's a research centre with an interest in new technology, it's largely driven by social scientists. So all of the social sciences are represented within the makeup of, um, of, the, of the different collaborators in the research centre. So I, for example, come from a public admin background. Professor Charles Rabb um, is an expert on privacy, but his background would be more political science. Uh, we have Kirsty Ball, who is a, more of an expert on organisational theory. And then we have Pete Plussy, who is a sociologist or a criminologist. So we have different social scientists represented within the within the, the, the leadership of the research centre, but many different other disciplines um, related in terms of the staff who take part in the research that we do. Okay, so I thought I would say something about surveillance because this is the most contested element of our title and of our interests. Okay, so we're, we're a research centre interested in information surveillance and privacy. So the term information and information technology is more readily understood. The term privacy is often it's a contested term, but it's a term that is slightly better understood, um, maybe translated often into data protection when it's related to information technology. But the term surveillance is often pro pro problematic for academic scholars. Um, and it's problematic for a number of reasons. Firstly, because it's, it's very contested. What is surveillance? Um, surveillance, some people would argue that surveillance is everywhere. Some people would say that surveillance is about the state doing surveillance. Some people might argue that it's marketing comes surveying and profiling us. So surveillance is a very contested term um, and it's very emotive. People have very strong feelings about the term surveillance and about their attitude towards people who undertake surveillance. So this is a bit of a quagmire for us as, as scholars to work our way through this. Um, and we have this term obviously Big Brother which 
which highlights um, the degree to which the term itself, surveillance, has entered the popular narrative and has entered, um, has a, a sense of meaning which we all understand. We would argue that surveillance is a very normal activity. It doesn't rely on new technology. It's an activity that, surveillance, that humans engage in every day, very frequently, all the time. So when we arrived here in Brazil, we were given tips about survival in Sao Paulo. And one of them was, you know, be aware of your surroundings as you walk around. Don't get your mobile phone out and show the world because someone will grab it. So this was, this was about self-surveillance, about the way that, we, the way that we, we conduct ourselves as we walk around. So we would argue that surveillance is a normal activity. What we're interested in specifically in this research centre is technologically mediated surveillance. So surveillance which is inactive and uh, created through the possibilities of new technology. So we're interested in processes and practices, but we're not technologically deterministic. So we would argue that we see these surveillance practices in all sorts of devices and technologies in modern society, from mobile phones to the internet to uh, number plate cam surveillance cameras, um, uh, satellite navigation. Uh, if you look at apps just on mobile phones, we, we've been using a lot of Uber taxis since we've been here. Massive surveillance implications and activities. Facebook, for example. So we see surveillance everywhere. Often the concept is linked to security, um, but we, we like to think about surveillance in everyday life. So we like to think of technologies that are part of our everyday existence, bank machines, um, your mobile phone, and think about the surveillance consequences and possibilities and implications that are embedded in that. So uh, that's our general approach to surveillance, and we would argue that it's ubiquitous, um, all technologies have a surveillance potential, even if they're not necessarily used for surveillance practices. And what we would also argue is that the surveillance lens, the perspective we're proposing, or the perspective that we use, highlights something different to just studies of new technology. It unpicks particularly power structures. Who does the surveying? Who is the surveyed? How are those relationships played out in society? Now this perspective for this research centre is unique. We're the only research centre in Europe that takes this perspective. There's only one other centre globally in Canada that takes a similar perspective to understanding the, the, the deployment of new technology with this surveillance perspective. Okay, so these are our aims. I think the text is quite small but readable. So we have typical um, academic aspirations in some senses. <laughs> Um, so producing research, publishing our research, um, but we also want to provide a focal point for understanding surveillance and we want to be a research centre that's understood as a place to go to if you want to think about surveillance. Um, we want to build on our existing synergies across the four universities uh, between partner institutions that are in projects that maybe also are not in the CRISP centre but we may be interacting with on a, on a broader scale. Um, we're providing a foundation for grant activity for large research projects. Um, we want to provide a, a foundation for doctoral training and supervision in, in the subject area. Um, and we want to provide the, an, a, a platform for engaging with practitioners and policy makers. And also um, an, a platform with providing information or awareness to the general public. So we're quite we have quite a broad remit for an academic research centre. We're not just interested in academic research. We're actually interested in engaging outside communities um, and contributing to public discourse about surveillance. Okay, so these are just some of our activities. Um, it did feel uh, quite odd condensing all of our activities into one slide, but I had a stab at it. Um, so we have an annual lecture. So we have a big public annual lecture every year. So this year we have the Scottish Information Commissioner doing our annual lecture. Uh, next year we have the UK Information, information Commission. We don't always use Information Commissioners. It just so happened that these, these two committed in these two years. Um, last year we used a very prominent journalist in the UK, a journalist who, who uh, um, was the first person to write about the activities of GCHQ in terms of surveilling uh, the national population in the UK, which wasn't widely known at the time. And we have also used very famous academics in the past. We have a big annual lecture, um, and, and that's all be in an evening. We have a large audience and a wine reception. So again, this is about pushing out um, our, our ideas out into the general public. We have a doctoral training school, which happens every second year. This is a week-long training school. Um, it's very intense. We have doctoral students from all over Europe and further afield. 
Uh, we haven't had anyone from Brazil yet, but we have had scholars from um, North America and I think Argentina and Australia. So maybe we'll get some Brazilian scholars in due course. Um, but the doctoral training school consists of a series of expert lectures, a series of training activities that relate to all elements of becoming a, an academic. So it could be learning how to publish, learning how to write research grants, learning how to deal with the media. We do all those sorts of things. Um, we have our next doctoral training school in next summer in June. We also have um, a regular panel at this conference. We call it CPDP, Computers Privacy and Data Protection Annual Conference. This is the big practitioners conference in Brussels every year. Um, essentially, this is policymakers. So we take we have a we have an agreement to have a panel every year, and we take our academic research to people who are responsible for uh, the regulation of privacy across Europe. So we, we pick different topics each year. Um, it could be, for example, we did body wall cameras one year. Um, I go in. And another year we did um, we did the quantified self, which is people who use devices to to measure their own data, quantify their their own data. Um, and so we, this year we're going to do something on policing and data. So we do different things to take some academic ideas out of the practitioner community. We've just launched a, a uh, book series with Rout, the publisher Routledge called Studies in Surveillance. Okay, we've just launched our first book in that, that series. Um, and this is going to be an outlet for surveillance scholars, surveillance community to publish their work. And then we have a series of specialist workshops. We bring together academics to develop ideas, develop their work, and to publish outputs. And these are just two that we've done this year. So we have one on religious ethics and 21st century surveillance. This is about to take place in the next few weeks. And then we had one earlier in the year looking at digital technologies and citizen participation. These are some of the activities that we typically engage in. And here is a Chris poster for the lecture that we have coming up. In a few weeks' time, Rosemary Agnew is the Information Commissioner in Scotland about her work um, in terms of uh, regulating information privacy and some of the surveillance consequences. So that's, uh, I'll just put that in there for I said at the outset that one of the things we so we do this in a number of ways. So we host something called the Scottish Privacy Forum. Now this is a forum of about 50 the senior government officials, senior academics, senior, pu senior public policy practitioners um, who come together um, and to discuss latest issues in terms of privacy and data protection. Okay, so that's typically about public services um, and issues that relate to public services. The information commissioner in the UK will regularly come to that meeting. Part of the meeting will be chatting, for those of you who don't know, Chatham House is behind that is that the conversation that you have stays in the legal room, so you're allowed to have a conversation that is maybe sensitive. So part of the meeting will be that. So the conversations about uh, whatever you're on the horizon. In the, in the UK at the moment, there's a lot on the horizon with a new regulation coming from Europe around data protection. We also give direct policy advice I'm providing direct advice to the Cam Commissioner. So we have a we have a commissioner in the UK. Um, he's developed a new strategy which I've been inputting in. One of my colleagues, Professor Charles Rao, has just been appointed to Police Ethics Board, which is looking at how the police use big data, how they do it and how do they do it ethically and what do they need to do to do it. Scottish government and other public agencies. Other ways we can, of course, are public lectures, which I've just been the usual uh, publicity machine or the website, the blog, and the Twitter. Okay, now these are some of the projects. Now, we have, there was many projects I could pick from, and I'm only going to obviously be able to give a, you know, just touch on these different projects, but I picked these out just because I thought they, they, they may be of interest. So the Smart Health project, the one at the top, is the one that we're all engaged in here. This is the Smart Health research team here. Um, and this is looking at um, smart governance, citizen engagement through new technologies. Uh, and that's a partnership between this university and Sterling. 
Um, but some of these other projects are also interesting. So, for example, we were interested we had a project called IRIS, Increasing Resilience in Surveillance Societies. This was all about the relationship between democracy and surveillance. Does surveillance practice Support traditional democratic practice does it support state activities? So that's what that project that recently finished. That was a large European project. Um, we also had a project called Assert, which looked at societal security. This project was all about taking a different approach to security. So instead of taking the idea that you can use technologies to support existing security arrangements, you can actually provide better security from from a bottom-up perspective by allowing citizens to wait. So it was a different approach to understanding new technology and security. Project Candid 2020 is a new European research project. Um, and this is actually looking at the activity in smart cities research project. Looking at what do social scientists do in smart cities research projects and they're regularly asking me to input into that process <laughs> and in fact I will be giving them all your addresses I couldn't fit the full title in here um, I'm actually not involved in that subject so I have to fill out stuff for them Charles Rabb at Edinburgh so is that typically smart cities projects are driven by technologists and not social scientists, yet they're social scientists in those projects. So what, what are they doing? What are they contributing to those projects? That's a basic idea. Um, this one, monetize me. This, uh, I've put all the logos around here just to, to not be just black and white text. Um, the monetize me project is all about understanding how the data from your body so it's all about the commercial aspects of things like Fitbit. It's also all service providers may initiate that and what some of the consequences are. Okay, that's not it's another project. One project that I am involved in um, and is driven by the Canadian Social Sciences Research Council is Big Data Surveillance. This project is all about understanding the surveillance implications of big data practices. So the profiling big data um, and what does that mean for surveillance? How can we understand it in terms of surveillance? And my contribution to that project is to think the regulatory environment has changed. So big data is a step change in terms of how we understand data protection because data protection is all data controllers, data owners. Big data changes that a lot because you often have have data that's, that's merged together from public and private sources and it isn't always clear who owns that data. So there's, there's, that's, uh, that's an ongoing project um, that's about Canada. So I'm going to finish there. I think that's about 20 minutes. Um, so that's a very brief overview of a lot of things that go on within the research centre. I mean, I'm happy to ask questions, answer questions now or at the end, whatever the <laughs> program. <laughs> Good to be here. It's very nice to be here in in Brazil. So thank you very much, Alexandra, for for hosting this this this. About, about our work. Um, what I want to do is um, a little bit different than Lynn's presentation because we don't have a clear center where our research takes place. So what I will be talking about is a little bit about our, and then we'll be talking about the work that. I do with several people, uh, Susanna's here, Anke's here, and work with other people at the university. And it's all grouped around the theme of public innovation. And, and I've looked at the website that you've been, and I've seen that public innovation is also a, an important theme in your, your research here. So we uh, 
then we can have right now or another moment in time some interesting discussions. Um, the way I look at public innovation is that it's, uh, it's about new ideas that result in new practices and that deliver new it's, it's very broad and very general, but in essence, I think that's what it's about. It's about focusing on ideas, on our ideas, focusing on the realization good ideas result in new practices, and in the end, the evaluation aspect is, does it result in new value? Are the ideas valuable? So in essence, that is, that is really what it is about. Um, um, and, and I work at this institute, the Utrecht University School of, of Governance. Um, Utrecht is a very, very different city than Sao Paulo. But it's so much time here. We, we think of it as 350,000 people, so I the other side. It's quite different in, in, in that respect, but it is a very nice city, as I'm sure uh, for Alexander and Erico can, can, uh, can tell you about. Um, we're in this, this um, old building in, in our um, inner city. Um, this building was built in, in 1860. Um, it was built as a laboratory for physics, because we had a pretty much famous uh, uh, scientist of physics, uh, Bias Palo, and he, he was so good that he got his own laboratory. Um, now the, physician, uh, the physics department has moved out of the city center, and we are in here with, with our school of governance. Um, we're much smaller than FGB, but for Dutch science, we're actually relatively large. and. Um, we're one of, I think, the top research uh, groups in, in, in the world when it comes to public administration. Um, we have about 60 people staff. Um, we make a combination of public administration and organizational science. Uh, we really focus on organizing public management is really the forefront. But we've also people working on human resource management in the public sector, people working on organizations culture, but also people working on managing professionals. So it's really some of these organizational issues in the public sector that we are interested in. Um, we have our own institute, but we uh, at Pittsburgh University, interdisciplinary work is, is, is so they emphasize that we need we, that we should not only stay within our own institute and work with the public administrationists, but to work with other people, and that's why it's really good to have some some here. He works at the department that they the sciences and um, well, one of the things that we want to do is to collaborate with geosciences so because they bring in other type of expertise. So what we have is that uh, we have a strategic theme, sustainability. Sustainability is one of the things that we like university and, and we work with people from geosciences and other people on sustainability. So that's a way to organize interdisciplinary work in your university. And another, you know, that's the Technical, it's not a goal, it's the theme of the hub, but again, it's a, it's a, it's a collaboration. It's on applied data science. So we work with data scientists, cognitive scientists, with the people in informatics to work on data science. So theme that's directly related to, uh, um, to this project of smart, uh, smart cities. Um, in this institute, these are some of the people that, that I directly work with. Um, I would see it say it's a, yeah, the pictures are not all that good. <laughs> but it's a combination of first. Uh, oh, recognize you. I recognize you. Yeah. I'm a doubt. I knew it was going to be on YouTube, so I hide the pictures on purpose. Um, yeah, so you all recognize, or you may recognize. I'm here. <laughs> so these, these are some assistant professors. I'm just here. Uh, some of the assistant professors I work with along around issues of uh, public innovation. Um, then I work in some uh, European uh, projects. One European project is on open data. I work with, uh, with Erna Reier here, and we have a, a large European project with teams from, from Italy, from Ireland, from France on the open data in the public sector. Uh, we have another project on social media in, uh, in policing. and, uh, in, um, yeah, this is another editor poster I work with, Leon Decker, so she works on, on this project. Um, then this is Iqbal Sankov, he also works on open data, he's a PhD from 
because I wanted to do a PhD with us. And I have some research, some of the research assistants that works on these projects. But it's not a formal group. It's not an official formal group. It's sorry. Susanna. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> right in the middle, key <laughs> person. Right in the middle. Many many apologies to key person here. Susanna for this project. For this project, key person Susanna is also working as a PhD on, on, on this project. So these are some of the, the people that I work with um, and or that collaborate here around issues of public innovation. Um, what I want to do in the remainder of this presentation is outline some, some issues. I want to talk a little bit further about research themes. When we talk about public innovation, what are the themes that we, we are interested in and are very relevant? I want to talk about methodological approaches. We're trying to be quite innovative also in our community. A little bit more about that. Um, Alexandra asked me to tell a little bit more about international networks. I already said something about some about a little bit more. And then I would like to end with saying something about value for society, how we think we can create value for society. I think that follows up quite nicely on some of, some of the things that William said. Um, the research themes. Um, can, you, can you read this? It yeah. says governance in an information age. Um, Key influence on my work was Manuel Castell's work on um, the information age, economy, society, and culture. Have you, do you know this work? Some of you may, you may not. Um, Manuel Castell's uh, ambition was to, to, to do an update of uh, Max Weber's uh, uh, classic work on Wirtschaft uh, um, uh, und Gesellschaft, that's uh, economy and society. And he wanted to sketch the key social, uh, social structure of our society in an information age. So it's a, it's a trilogy, there are three books, to write, uh, substantive books, but I think it's a key volume for understanding what this age is about. And what I feel is that what we should add as public administration scholars is to add an understanding of governance in an information age. So I think he gives a very good description of what the society, economy, and culture are like in an information age. And I think what we can add to that is an understanding of governance in an information age, or at least that's that's what I feel is important that we should add to it. Um, and to, to do this, um, I study different uh, themes with, with people in this room and uh, some other people. Um, for example, e-government is, is a key focal point. Um, I'm also the chair, um, together with, with William, um, of the ECPA Permanent Study Group. that are co-chair from Ireland. Um, well, one of the things that we uh, look at is Alignment, which is a classic theme in e-government study, is there an alignment between the strategy? Um, but I hope with Victor Beckers from Rotterdam University, we look at a meta-theory of e-government. We use different philosophical perspectives to get a rich understanding of e-government from a social constructivist perspective, from a positivist perspective, from a critical perspective to show how we should not make the government studies into a purely instrumental field, how to use technology to make government better, but also in a more um, Transparency is a key theme. Um, I wrote my PhD piece also on transparency um, and the, the dynamics of transparency. also influences how policies are drafted and implemented. So there's a recursive relation between transparency and policy, and therefore the policy changes are often very difficult to predict. Um, what we see your school results, um, schools started to behave differently, parents started to choose different schools, and therefore, there was a new discussion about what kind of transparency we want to get good education. So this, this is never a stable situation. Transparency changes the way we think about, uh, the way we interact. And these interactions, again, influence transparency. So this recur recursive relation is something I'm very interested in. Uh, social media, I told you something about um, um, 
the social media and policing. Um, I've done quite a bit of work around social media and policing. And one of the things I'm really interested in is, does this trigger new value conflicts? For example, if police officers uh, use social media, they can put an, an, a child is lost or they're looking for a criminal. They could put a picture on, on, um, in, on Twitter, on Facebook, and that would really help to apprehend the criminal or to find the child. At the same time, William would not be happy with this because <laughs> yes, they would sure. say this is uh, impeaching on their price. The use of social media and the privacy of specific persons. But what we're interested in is how do professionals, police professionals in practice, deal with this type of value conflict? Um, we look at regulating innovation. Um, one of the domains we looked at is regulation of uh, pharmaceutical innovation. Um, there's a large need for all kinds of medicines because there are many, uh, many uh, medical needs that are not being met. At the same time, these medicines have to be safe, so they need to be regulated. Um, what we do is, is how we can balance the, the requirements of safety of medicines to, to, to introduce medicine. Um, public innovation is a, is a key theme. Um, what I look at specifically is the role of individual innovators. We had a very interesting meeting yesterday in Kurichiba with somebody who played a key role in innovation processes. Um, I'm very interested in the role of these individuals because sometimes they're um, they're loners, sometimes they're really um, bureaucrats, and sometimes you see people that manage to bridge the gap between the need for innovation and the bureaucratic structure of government. So I'm really very interested in understanding who these individuals are and what what I developed is sort of this theory of net, what I call network heroism. How the connections between individuals is crucial to understanding the impact they make. Um, open data um, is a European project on, on open data. What we are interested in is social learning. So there is open data out there. Open data can be used by, 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 by citizens. But what we often see is the usage is very limited. So what we want to study is can we design and develop forms of open data that uh, facilitate forms of social learning. Uh, a very concrete example that we're working on right now is um, we're trying to see whether there's a discussion, well, you probably find it nonsense because here it's so much busier, but even in Utrecht, our small, quiet city in the Netherlands, there's a discussion about the level of noise in the, in the city uh, center. Um, and this is quite an intense discussion because some people feel that we should have more festivals, more bars, more restaurants, we want to like the inner city, and other people say, you know, we want to quiet, we want to live there, we want to sleep. So there's this discussion about the, yeah, what they call the livability versus the liveliness of the inner city. And we're trying to see if we can bring out open data about levels of noise or uh, other issues that are relevant, if that can help to trigger a learning process between all the stakeholders. Smart cities, well, it's what this project is about. We're trying to study how uh, citizens can play a key role in smart cities. The tone and discord about smart cities is very much a top-down one. How can governments use smart cities to make uh, policies more effective? What we want to add is what can citizens do to make cities smarter? So it's very much a bottom-up perspective. And the final theme is uh, co-production. Um, what, what, what we uh, see, for example, with uh, things like Wikipedia or Linux is that uh, citizens can collaborate on a very large scale to create an encyclopedia or create um, an operating system. What we are interested in is can citizens also co-produce um, solutions in the public domain? And for example, we looked at the co-production of safety. How can citizens be engaged in the production of safety by police officers, by bringing in new information, by forming their own networks and connecting to the police? Um, so it's a whole range of topics, and um, yeah, here, um, but I can probably send that presentation around. I have some example of, of the papers that, that we have published on these issues. We published by the Canadian Government Information Quarterly, which is quite an important journal for, for people that are interested in the ICT in the public sector. Public administration uh, review is, is, of course, in our field an important uh, topic, so yeah, we published uh, on co-production transparency. Um, information quality is another journal that is important when it comes to um, um, IT in the public sector. So with the with the PhD 
you don't need to publish the paper there on, on open data. Um, smart cities um, is important. Um, I wrote a paper with a colleague from Spain on, on governing the, the, this, the smart cities. Um, we also try to publish more, more urban journals, urban affairs reviews is, is, is the journal where we have a paper coming out. Um, this is on social media, more also on behavioral journals, behavioral information technology, public management review for, this is a very good journal for, for I think, and, um, and this is a little bit further from, from what I usually do, the research policy journal when it comes to, um, to technology dynamics in, in uh, dynamics around the technology. So you see all the themes that I just identified in this map coming back in, in, in some of these uh, papers. Um, and an interesting question, I've already said something about it, what, what do we know, what, what have we learned from all this project? Do we know more about public innovation? Do we know more about these dynamics? Do we know more about for our, our ambition of governance in an information age? And I think there, there, there's some, something that we, we have identified and well, largely also building on other, other theories but that are quite, quite crucial to governance in an information age. Um, and one thing that keeps coming out of research is the idea of complex dynamics. I just gave you the example of transparency in the educational domain. Um, what we often see is that uh, there's a recursive relation between the different concepts. Um, and whereas often in, in yeah, sort of standard academic uh, um, approaches, we study a relation between an independent and independent variable, what we see is that again and again, that it's, it's not really possible to identify the independent and dependent variable because there's all kinds of feedback loops. Um, so also when it comes to, uh, to smart cities, there is a recursive uh, relation between citizen participation and smart city uh, dynamics. So these complex dynamics mean that we have to study these emergent patterns, the patterns that come out of the dynamic interaction between different social processes. Um, the second thing is instrumental processes, effects are overrated. Um, what we're find, finding time and again, and it would be very interesting to hear that from you as well, is that um, the effects of the use of new technologies or new innovations in the public domain are overrated. If it comes to democracy, if it comes to public services, if it comes to trust, time and again we see that there are huge promises that are being made, we're going to use e-government and then people will be very happy with the services, we're going to use uh, websites and then we'll create a huge, uh, uh, we'll create transparency, and we'll use uh, new innovative forms of democracy and then people will start trusting our democratic institutions. It, it's not happening. I think to a large extent instrumental effects are overrated. It doesn't mean that we have to, should not be studying it, but I think we, we can, this is a clear message that comes out of social science research. Process, two, two things. One thing is, and that's really building upon Costell's work, but also something like Barry Wellman from, from Canada, um, is that the networks of individuals are important. And I think that is still something that has not landed well in our field in public administration. We still tend to think either in terms of institutions or individuals, Whereas what people like Castells and Bellman identify quite clearly is that it's not so much the organizational level nor the individual level, it's the networks of individuals that, that make, make a difference. And um, well, you can also look at the way we collaborate. It's not like, we, we, what we often say is it's collaboration between FGV, Sterling University, and Utrecht University, but in effect it's just a, a collaboration between different individuals that work in different parts of the world. So in, in research, I think it's very much about these individuals, but also in the, in the public domain. I studied, for example, uh, innovation in the police sector, and it could not be understood on the basis of institutions of individuals. And really, to understand what came out of this innovation, I had to understand all these linkages between individuals. So I think that is something that we really need to uh, take into account that really changes our understanding of the public sector. A second one is uh, social learning. Um, and that's partly related to this point. I think if we talk about something like co-production or transparency or e-government, we have to understand these as processes of social learning where people interact to change their perceptions and maybe also their, their, their behavior. And, and this learning perspective really helps to understand this process, process of change. But if we look at it too, 
instrumentally how one intervention changes the behavior, we will not find much. But if we study these learning processes over time, and also maybe find ways to support these learning processes, um, changes are much more likely. Um, overall, and this is more, mostly also from a critical perspective, um, what we're finding is that the political element is often neglected when it comes to uh, innovation in the public domain. Innovation is something seen that is good for everyone. Um, for example, if you look at smart cities, the promise of smart city uh, technologies is that will make cities safer, cleaner, more accessible. It will make everybody happy in the end. That, that is the promise. But it's not going to make everybody happy, so I'm sorry for, for this message, but not to be disappointed. Um, it's going to make some people happy, and some people may be the people that sell these technologies or people that benefit from, from these technologies, and other people may not be happy at all. So there is a lot of politics in these artifacts, but the politi politics is to a large extent hidden under these instrumental logics. So as social scientists, I think we again and time again we have to show the politics that are in these artifacts. Innovation is ideology. A smart city agenda is very much a neoliberal agenda. It's often about just limiting the role of government. It's very much about how uh, the public sector, private sector, can do a better job than the public sector. Well, maybe in some policy domains it can. I mean, I'm not an opponent of the private sector, but it's very much an ideological agenda, much more than sort of an, uh, a fact based logic. So these are some of the things that sort of come out of this research into governance and information. And um, the way we study this is, uh, is we try to use different uh, approaches. Um, Multi-method approaches are becoming increasingly popular in public administration, and I think for good reasons, because it's very often uh, leads to sort of rich insights if you do a combination of more quantitative work or qualitative work. Um, so you use different different approaches. Um, what we Increasingly, is um, is experimental research. Um, we're doing behavioral experiments. Uh, for example, we're doing now a more sort of replication of an experiment that has been done before. Uh, we want to know uh, when it comes to freedom of information requests if local governments are more likely to give information when a citizen refers to the Freedom of Information Act or when they just ask the information. So the way we do it is we, we do a random field experiment among all local governments in the Netherlands. We ask them for certain documents and we test whether whether uh, referring to the law results in more information than not referring to the law. Well, that's typically an example of, of experimental research that, that helps us to, to, to study this. Um, what we set up, at, uh, well, we don't, we're not at the level of crisp yet, but um, we, are, we have set up a governance lab future. Um, so this is a collaboration between different researchers with the ambition of uh, strengthening our research in the public domain. Um, so it provides a research facility, teaching environment, expertise center, consulting design facility, and governance practices and innovation. So we enable a research team of students to study governance practices with new techniques and methods. Um, basically, what we have in this, in this governance lab future is on the one hand, expertise in, uh, in uh, behavioral experiments. So it's about doing these experiments, often through through survey experiments. So we set up alumni from our, from our programs, and we use this panel to do survey experiments. Um, in, we're doing uh, um, living lab experiments. So we'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. Living lab experiments are sort of a, a relation uh, zero. Okay. Living lab experiments are, are related. So working with design methods, but my hand is up. Later on, more questions. Yes, I think uh, because we have just one hour. Yeah, so I end with this one to have some time for questions. Um, yeah, this one, doing research with society is something that we really want to do. So this is a paper that we're working on and it's also really at the heart of this governance lab. 
what we want to um, explore further is how we can become actively engaged, not only in studying practices, but also changing these practices. So this is a method that's, uh, that's used uh, quite a bit in, in, in other fields. Um, we think it has great potential for, for doing research I mean, in our field. Susanna, for example, is now also engaged in uh, helping citizen city of to develop their smart city project and she's, she's engaging in it but she's also studying it and it's also what we're doing with this open data and the city of Utrecht. So we want to develop this approach further and we want to do, do this in this governance lab in Utrecht to form sort of an expertise center on new innovative approaches in the public domain. So uh, thank you very much and uh, I hope we have some time for questions. <laughs> Yes, we have some time for questions, and if you want to, to pose a question to William, to Robert, or to the others. Yeah, I have a question. It's about big data surveillance. Yeah? Uh, can you talk a little bit more about the project that you have in the research? Yeah, so this is a a five-year project. Um, it's being led by uh, Professor David Lyon at Kingston University. They they have a surveillance study centre there, so it's the other research centre globally that has an interest in surveillance. Um, it's a partnership project in that it has a mix of academic institutions and practitioner bodies engaged in the research from the outset. So it has a number of privacy commissioners involved in the research. Um, in Canada, they have the uh, the regulation of privacy is devolved quite significantly in Canada. So you have a national privacy commissioner, but then you have regional ones which have quite a lot of authority. So there's lots of privacy commissioners involved. There's also a number of uh, privacy advocate organisations, civil liberties organisations involved. So the project is split into three main avenues of activity. One of them is around um, profiling, marketing, political profiling. So it's about using big data to profile citizens, customers, um, and service users. And the idea there is to think about how profiling takes place, how algorithms are constructed, how people are accountable for those algorithms in terms of how they're built, and whether or not the outcomes of those algorithms are fair. So um, it's, it's a, a study of um, what happens in practice in the real world. So the idea is that um, a lot of surveillance, surveillance research is about understanding fairness. So understanding how our data processes are perceived to be fair or otherwise. So that's just one strand of activity. Um, there is another strand which looks at uh, specifically policing security and national intelligence, um, working around the field of national massively problematic because of access problems. So I'm not engaged in that strand, but that strand um, I can contribute to the public security in terms of my work on research on surveillance cameras. Um, but they are um, that also that stream of activity is very Canada specific, very much about Canadian laws and regulations. Um, and then and then there's one stream of activity which is much more focused on public services. So how do public services perceive and use big data or address issues to do with data science? So part of that is about building skill sets, part of it is about um, how public services with limited technical expertise are still expected to use big data processes and again thinking about the consequences of that. So that, that's in a, in a nutshell what that project's about. Does that, does that help? Yes, yes. Could you please talk about uh, the challenges or the issues of conducting projects with international teams and different perspectives, different uh, backgrounds, different cultures? Yeah. Can you start? Yeah. Um, well, the there's actually two, 
a little bit some of the projects I'm working on. There, there's two elements. There's the international collaboration and there's the interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, I must say I often find the interdisciplinary collaboration more difficult than the international collaboration. In the, uh, um, the project of working on the open data project, we're working with some people from, um, uh, from information science and they, they think radically different. They, they, uh, they think very different about it. No idea at all what, what government is and what politics is and what policies are. Um, so they, 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 that makes it, yeah, they, and, and, and because they have no idea, and probably I don't have any good understanding of basic concepts in their field. So that, that's quite a, quite a very difficult bridge to, to cross. Um, at, at the same time, I do feel that working it really enriched me in, 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 our, in my work. For example, we've done some papers on activity theory, which is quite often used in, in the social psychology, but it's not something that I had run across. So, uh, so for me, that was also very, very helpful. But, um, but I must say, especially, come, I, I think the collaborate well with some people, I mean, with Stone, their field is quite related to what we're doing. Many theories are similar. So then I think you have sort of a productive distance. I, I think with some other disciplines, I find it very, very challenging. Um, when it comes to the international collaboration, yeah, I find it really, really helpful. And actually, I didn't talk at all, and William and I, we had to, of course, bring it back to some time. I think it was a little bit more successful than I was probably. But, <laughs> but, but we didn't talk about teaching. But I think also for, for, for my role as a professor, I mean, a key role, I think, is teaching students. And, and, and therefore, the international experience is also very important. Stom just took lots of pictures in Kuri Chiba because he talks about Kuri Chiba in his class. But it's really good to, to know these experiences. So it, it, it helps me a lot to, 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 to develop, to learn as a, as a scholar. Um, at the same time, sometimes it, it is difficult to bring this together into strong papers. And that's also yeah, one of the uh, struggles, we, one of the challenges in this, in this project, also because the yeah, the institution environment is sometimes different. For example, William could, uh, um, what was was not in a position to, to hire a PhD because in the, in the ESRC conditions it had to be a, a, a researcher. And, and what well, Charlie's doing a great job, but it means that we do not have three PhD projects that are sort of in the same dynamics. So you have the institutional conditions that sometimes make it more difficult. Um, at the same time, you learn learn more from it. So, uh, but what I what I do over time is focus more on national collaborations that are interdisciplinary and international collaborations that are monodisciplinary. That, for me, that seems to be a better way of doing it. Yeah, I think I would echo a number of our sentiments there. There is an art form to building a successful research collaboration. Um, one element of it, which Albert didn't particularly mention, is personalities. So if you're going to be working with people, but they're not going to be in the office next door, you need to be comfortable enough with them, that you know them well enough that you can communicate with them by email. And email can be a terror for, for miscommunication. So um, a key part is, is actually working in a collaboration with people you know, or people you trust, or people that you are friends with. That helps a lot. Um, also, what... No, no, not completely. No, no, but Albert and I knew each other yes, very well. Yes, to, to point. So, um, so not completely, but there was an element of that in our in our project. Um, the other aspect, which I, I think Albert's kind of set out already, is that different disciplinary approaches in a collaborative project can lead to disagreements from day one. So you can sit down in your first meeting and have a disagreement about a core concept in your project. And you have to, as researchers, be flexible enough to work your way around that, that maneuver. So I'll give you an example. The project Increasing Resilience in Surveillance Societies, that was a three-year project. And even at the end of the project, we were still arguing about the concept of resilience. <laughs> the different academic disciplines approached it completely differently, um, of what that concept meant. So my feeling is that a degree of flexibility is always required. Um, and it's important not to get hung up too much 
on my own disciplinary norms that I rely on as I go about my academic business, but to try and make sure I understand where other academics come from and their perspectives. Okay. So, one more question? No. And it was just one quick question. Yeah, this is for Albert because you mentioned in your presentation that uh, smart cities have a promise to uh, develop a uh, better city and is uh, kind of not really not real. But we saw in almost all the papers that we I, I read is always the same. Oh, smart cities have the promise to be increase the cities and develop better cities. Why do we academics continue to this concept that smart city is a good concept and not critical, you know, criticizing this concept? Yeah, no, that, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I, I actually try to sort of economically work with other concepts. For example, urban innovation for me is often a more, more useful way of thinking about it and is less connected to a certain ideological frame of mind. Um, but there's two reasons why I also still use the term smart city. Is because the first reason is because it's um, academics that are doing this research. There's sort of this uh, community that we're forming with. Well, uh, Marie, uh, Alexander, and I are all three members of a smart city uh, consortium. So these academics are grouping themselves around certain concepts. And if you want to use another concept, you don't make the connections to these groups of academics. And very practically, you, you may write a very interesting paper, but if you don't use the term smart city, then people will just not find the paper or, or use it in, in, in their work. So in this case, you're sort of forced to use that concept to connect academically. And a second reason is um, that many uh, uh, projects, uh, uh, many um, uh, funding opportunities are related to the concept of of smart city, uh, product, smart city technologies. So, um, and that I think that's a general risk in the academic world at the moment. Is that very often uh, um, um, when the, in all of you have the NWO uh, here, you have, you have uh, FAPESH, okay. uh, you have uh, ESRC in, 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 in the UK, and there's the European projects programs. They often frame their their programs in a certain way and force us. To reframe our our, uh, our ideas in such a way that they will get funded. So this this funding rationality has a huge impact on the way we, we, we do our work. So what I do is I try to create some room to to develop new concept or develop more reflective or analytical approaches. But I still feel I should not not avoid using the concepts for the two reasons that I just mentioned. I think I would confirm Albert's comments because. If you want to engage in contemporary public policy, you've got to use the language of contemporary public policy. And the same goes for funding councils. So a lot of the terms we've used today, big data, resilience, these are all really important terms in public policy circles. So if we want to engage with them, we have to use their language. Um, and if you're applying for research grants, you have to demonstrate that you're very contemporary. So you use the, the language of, of the contemporary public policy environment. Um, and doesn't mean you can't navigate your way through it and explain that this is a piece of terminology that has a lot of rhetoric, a lot of embedded meaning, driven by industry, whatever the case may be. Um, but it's very difficult to avoid using those terms, especially if you're applying for a large research grant in a, in a call where the title has smart cities in it. And how can you, uh, you know, it's very difficult to, to avoid. Okay. okay, thank you all for coming. Uh, and I would like to thank especially to Albert and uh, William.